history is back online. The largest scale military operation since World War II is currently underway. Russia, controlled by, not led by, controlled by autocrat dictator Thug, not president, Thug Putin, invading Ukraine. The free, sovereign, democratic, absolute right to exist Ukraine. And this is just as much about China as it is about Russia. This is just as much about Taiwan as it is about Ukraine. This is about the international community waking up to the realities that the post-World War II decades-long peace we've had, that's been a beautiful time to be alive, is at stake and we need to wake up and we need to start taking it seriously and protect the freedom of democracies everywhere. Now, there's a lot going on, especially in the first, what, it's been less than 24 hours. I'm recording this at 6.34 p.m. Pacific time, February 24th. It hasn't even been 24 hours since the invasion has taken place. There's a lot of information. Morgan Hussol had a great, uh, had a great tweet about this. A lot of information that comes out during crises and is, is bullshit. So we need to, we need to be careful uh, with with our sources. We need to be careful with what we're looking at. We need to not jump to crazy conclusions, um, and we need to we need to keep a level head here. So I'm going to go through. I'm going to do things a little bit differently than I usually do. I'm going to share a few a uh, few pieces, uh, particularly from Peter Zihan, Peter Zihan, who's a total legend, who I've been following and talking about on this podcast really since it started. I've been following him since 2016, maybe 2017. He's been talking about the inevitability of Russia invading Ukraine for years. He's written books on it. He's written posts on it. He's recorded videos about it. And he's one of the people that has really helped guide my thinking leading up to this. And he's had a couple epic posts, which I'm going to share. So... Again, on No Gradient, we're really big here about figuring out who are the people we need to follow, what do we need to listen. So what do we need to listen to? <clears throat> now, I'm going to start, I'll get to Peter Zihan's post, um, and then I'm going to go through, a, and then I'm going to kind of, it's going to get a little looser. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to go through some tweets, um, and I'm going to see if I can edit this together. I'm going to record my screen as I'm going through it. I think that might be interesting for folks. Uh, to watch this if you're watching on YouTube so you can see what I'm seeing on the computer right here. And yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, okay, let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to start with a, a speech from uh, President Zelensky of, of Ukraine. His last ditch effort to try to keep peace and I'm just going to read his I'm going to read his speech verbatim he released a video he's, he's speaking Russian let's do it I would like to address the citizens of Russia directly not as president but as a citizen of Ukraine and I address the citizens of Russia as I would the citizens of Ukraine we share a more than 2,000 kilometer border your soldiers are stationed all along it almost 200,000 soldiers and thousands of military vehicles your leaders have chosen for them to take a step forward into the territory of another country and that single step could be the beginning of a great war on the european continent the whole world speaks of what could happen day to day a cause for war would arise at any moment any provocation any incident could be the flare of a fire that burns everything you have been told that this flame will bring liberation to ukraine's people but the ukrainian people are free they remember their own past and will build their own future. They build, they do not destroy. As they themselves have told you day after day on television, the Ukraine in your news and the Ukraine of real life are two entirely different places and the difference is that the latter is real. They tell you that we're Nazis and this is true. One of the false pretenses that Putin is going in with is saying the denazification of Ukraine, which is absolutely batshit insane. But how can, <clears throat> how can a people that lost 8 million lives to defeat the Nazis support Nazism? How can I be a Nazi? Say it to my grandfather who fought in World War II as a Soviet inf infantryman and died a colonel in an independent Ukraine. 
They tell you that we hate Russian culture. How can one hate a culture, any culture? Neighbors always enrich each other's cultures. However, we are not part of one we are not part of one whole. You cannot swallow <coughs> swallow us up. We are different, but this difference is not a reason for en- for enmity. We want to determine our own course and build our own history peacefully, calmly, and honestly. They told you that I would order an attack on Donbas, order indiscriminate shootings and bombings. This led to some questions, some very simple ones. Who are we shooting at? What are we bombing? Donetsk, which I have visited dozens of times, where I looked in people's faces in their eyes. Artyoma Street, where I strolled with friends. The Donbass Arena, where I rooted for our boys together with Ukrainian lads at the European Championships. Sherbakov Park, where I drank with friends when our boys lost. Luthansk, where, where the mother of my best friend is buried. Where his father also rests. Take note that I'm speaking to you all in Russian now, but no one in Russia knows the meaning of these places, these streets, these names, these events. These are all alien to you, unfamiliar. This is our land and this is our history. What will you fight for and with whom? Many of you have visited Ukraine. Many of you have relatives here. Some might have studied at Ukrainian universities and befriended Ukrainians. You know our character, you know our people, and you know our principles. You know what we value. So stop and listen to yourselves, to the voice of reason, to the voice of common sense. Hear us. The Ukrainian people want peace, as does their government. Not only do they want it, but they demonstrate their desire for peace. They do everything they can. We are not alone. It is the truth that Ukraine is supported by many nations. Why? It is not about peace at any cost. It is about peace and principles of justice of international law. It is about the right to self-determination that every person might determine their own future. It is the right of every society and every person to security, to a life without threats. I am certain that these rights are important to you as well. The truth is that this needs to end before it is too late. If Russia's leadership does not want to meet us across the table for the sake of peace, perhaps it will sit at the table with you. Do you Russians want a war? I would very much like to know the answer, but the answer depends only on you, on the citizens of the Russian Federation. Thank you for your attention. This, of course, was released before the invasion had begun. This was a last-ditch effort, uh, released on February 23rd. Uh, now, a couple, a couple things. Putin also had a speech. So, just to go through the series of events here, there's a couple regions in Ukraine that Russia claims have there's 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 they view as act you know they view as russians in those two regions and those two regions those two areas in the ukraine called for support from putin a public support giving pretext saying we need your help putin's talked about a genocide going on in ukraine against russian peoples in ukraine putin's coming under the pretext coming under the pretext as invading under the pretext as peacekeeper with stated goals of denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. Essentially, and based on the targets that have been attacked, it's not just the, the, the eastern coast of Ukraine. It's all through the entire nation. This isn't an annexation of Crimea, which was an international disaster. This is a full-scale attack on a free and democratic nation. Multiple targets throughout the entire nation. You can see maps of it. Uh, so I'm going to color some of this stuff with Peter Zihan, who I was talking about. He's been writing about this stuff for years. I highly recommend him. He's got a great newsletter. He also releases videos. I'm just going to read his posts. I'm going to read his posts because I think they're super important. They're not very long. There's only a couple more things I'm going to read here. I'll read two of his posts because I think they really lay the groundwork to get you caught up to speed on what the fuck is going on. Let's continue. So this is a post from February 21st. It's called Ukraine, the war after the war. In a public broadcast late February 21st, Russia president, Russia thug, Vladimir Putin gave a lengthy, moody speech about the status of relations between Russia and its neighbor Ukraine. Putin, in essence, declared a formal Cold War with the West while also making clear his belief that an independent Ukraine should not exist, going so far as to erroneous, erroneously claim the nation a creation of Lenin and that he will do something about it. Effective immediately, Putin formally recognized the two secessionist bits of Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk, that he has been supporting with special forces troops, weapons, intelligence, and air support for the past seven years. In his mind, they are now independent countries and allies. This is what I was talking about. This is one of the pretexts. This is the identical playbook to what Putin did a couple of provin- in a couple of provinces of another former Soviet state, Georgia, back in the 2000s. The idea being that these Russian-created, Russian-funded, and Russian-armed statelets are allies. 
Allies deserve Russian troops to protect them. And under Russian law, such Russian deployments are empowered to attack territories adjacent to the new allies to secure allied interests. In 2008, similar Russian deployments led to a brief war which smashed the military of Georgia. Russian troops remain in Georgia territory today. I bet many people didn't know that. I need to be reminded of that. I did not know that. In case you've been living under a rock, the Russians have been steadily amassing multiple invasion forces on Ukraine's borders for a couple of months now, with the most recent guesstimate of the force total approaching 200,000, the greatest concentration of focused military power the world has seen since the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. On a number of occasions, the Russians have claimed to be withdrawing forces, but civilian satellite monitoring has vividly illustrated that such removed troops have redeployed closer to the border. In the aftermath of today's speech, multiple unconfirmed reports already indicate that Russian troops have moved into Donetsk and Luhansk. Remember, this is before the invasion has started. This post was released. Russia propaganda isn't what it once was. This is where it gets funny, and this is the beautiful Zyham we know and love. In Soviet times, it was often subtle, working through multiple intermediaries to provide rhetorical buffers, while also trickling into the conventional wisdom. It would seem to seep in from everywhere. Now it's just literally making up easily disprovable stuff up on live television and then moving on to the next blatant lie. And the only people who give it any credence are folks who have no choice. Think Belarus, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. Or folks who have consciously blended the Russian lies into their own domestic ideological narratives. Think Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega, U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders, or Fox News host Tucker Carlson. Literally get wrecked on. Even Chinese state media has, is giving the Russians a look that communicates, really, that's what you're going with? Russian leadership isn't what it once was. Once it became clear in 1975 that Soviet Premier Leon, Leonid Brezhnev was little more than an occasionally shuffling corpse, yes. real power shifted to the Soviet intelligence directorate, specifically KGB chairman Yuri Andropov. This shouldn't shock. The Soviet system existed in an information vacuum, so the people with the most power were those who actually knew what was real and what was propaganda. In time, Andropov became Soviet premier, as did two of his acolytes, Konstantin Chernenko and Mikhailov Gorbachev. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And then the Soviet Union ended. About the same time the KGBers took over, the Soviet Union went broke. The late 1970s and 1980s were a time of immense economic upheaval and near collapse, which preceded worse upheaval and actual collapse. One of the many ways the late Soviet leadership attempted to square their failing circles was to reduce government spending on everything, but most notably on education, mass science and technical and manufacturing education. The Soviet Union, in effect, ended in the early 1980s. Russia is a pale shadow. Of, this is important. Russia is a pale shadow of the Soviet Union, and Russia never restarted mass educational efforts, which means the last crop of Soviet KGB agents and leaders are the sole remaining pool of talent from which today's Russian leadership can draw. Putin is 69. The youngest people who had completed their Soviet education before the bottom fell out are now, ni are now 59. The average life expectancy for Russian males is 64. It's a shithole country. The Russian strategic position is not what it was. The Russian heartlands are great wide open. Are great wide opens. Defending great wide opens takes more troops than any country could supply. So, as Russian Tsar Catherine the Gate famously put it, I have no way to defend my borders but to extend them. Now, this goes back, as I had talked about, this goes back. This is deep in Russian culture, and I think it's a lot of it's it's a lot of a lot of what people don't actually understand. It's, this isn't. I think common common knowledge. So as a Russian czar, Catherine the Great famously put it, yeah, extend them until they have reached a physical feature that blocks invasion. Doing such would enable Russian troops to hunker down and plug the gaps between mountain and desert and sea. At the height of Soviet power, the Russians controlled all nine of those geographic gaps that allow entry to the Russian heartlands. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia commanded but one. Courtesy of Putin's wars of, ex of expansion and peacekeeping efforts in the former Soviet space, the Russians now have forces in six. Of the remaining gateways, two lie on Ukraine's western border, the Polish and Bessarabian ga gaps. In my mind, the question was never, will Russia invade Ukraine and attempt to absorb it in totality, but instead win? The Kremlin has been threatening Kiev for a decade now. My caution today's Russia watchers has been that there was little occurring which suggested, which suggested this season's round of Russian angst and anger was in any way unique until today. Putin's speech does more than merely suggest that Russia is ready to go. Sanctioned. Sanctions, real or imagined, in place or threatened, will not shift Putin's stance. For Russia, control of Ukraine isn't simply seen 
as a birthright, but as an issue of national survival. The Russian population suffers so completely from drug abuse, alcoholism, malnutrition, and disease that it is the, the world's fastest collapsing demography. Although recent statistical updates suggest China is challenging Russia for the top spot. Patrolling Russia's current borders is laughably beyond the capacity of Russia's current population. But forward positioning what troops remain in those gateways, that just might work. So the Russians will try. About the only would-be sanction which might, might earn a blank from the Kremlin would be if the Europeans all swore off Russian oil and natural gas. That export line item is far and away the Russian government's largest moneymaker, accounting for a hefty majority of income. But in doing so, the Europeans will be cutting off their primary energy provider, condemning themselves to the dark and cold. And so that specific threat hasn't happened. I'd be impressed and shocked if it did. I'd be equally... It's also crazy that Germany was even entertaining Nord Stream 2, the pipeline from Russia to Germany to supply them supply them gas. I'd be equally shocked if the fall of Ukraine were the end of the story. Ukraine is not a NATO ally. The West will not send regular troops to support Ukraine. That makes Ukraine, with its 45 million strong population, the easy target. What assistance arrives will be designed to snarl the Russians in, a, in as painful and bloody of an occupation as possible. The real show, the real war, comes after. The two most important gateways to the Russian heartland remain. The Baltic Sea coast and the portion of the Polish gap it lies in. Well, Poland. Unlike Ukraine, the countries in question here, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, are members of the NATO alliance and of the European Union as well. The Baltic beaches and the plains of Poland are where the future of Russia and the West of the European Union and NATO will ultimately be decided. It is there that Russia will succeed or die. This is far worse than it sounds. Russia's population is in free fall. A Russian occupation of Ukraine com completed to Russia's satisfaction will still absorb most of what's left of Russia's conventional military capabilities, leaving only the decidedly unconventional available for the next conflict. Russia won't fight its twilight war with soldiers. Now he's referencing nukes there. Scary. Now let's read a second post. Hopefully that painted a good picture for you. Let's read the second post that shorter that occurred after uh, the invasion had begun. For those of you who have read my second book, The Absent Superpower, recent events in Ukraine should not come as a surprise. Chapter 6, The Twilight War, lays out how Russian geography and demographic realities would dictate Russian aggression in its immediate periphery. This is not a justification of Moscow's aggression against its neighbor, but international watchers should not be feigning surprise. Nor should the current invasion of Ukraine be seen as a result of madness or a personal vendetta of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Russian leaders have viewed control of Ukraine, the Crimean Peninsula, and access to the Black Sea as, a, as vital to the security of Russia and Russian interests for centuries. I would not argue that geopolitics is determinative, but geography tells a story. Russia is wide open. Flat geography has proved little in the way of resistance to would-be invaders as varied as the Mongols and Napoleon, and the horrors of both world wars still weighs heavily on the minds of Russians and their leaders. Does Putin wish for a return of the glory of the Soviet Union? Maybe. I can't and don't want to claim any particular insights into the inner workings of his mind. But Putin's flexing of his military might in Chechnya and Georgia most recently in Ukraine, would not only have been understandable to Catherine the Great and the Tsars, not to mention Soviet premiers, but seen as necessary for Russian security. But unlike his predecessors, Putin's working with a terminal demography. Russia's geography certainly hasn't improved, but in the years since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, a collapsing healthcare sector, skyrocketing alcohol and substance abuse, falling birth rates, declining life expectancies, and the ravages of D's, of disease, including tuberculosis and HIV AIDS, has left Moscow to secure vast ter territories with a shrunken and shrinking military. If Russian geography can help explain the why of recent aggression, Russian demography can help us understand the timing. It's now or never, and for Russian leaders, the latter isn't an option. Consider the above map from the absent superpower. Pushing into, sec into and securing the Caucasus give Russia a hard mountainous, mountainous border to the south of its critical access zones to the Black Sea and through the Turkish Straits, the Mediterranean. After a couple of largely successful military campaigns in the mid-aughts, plus a fr friendly Armenia, there is a pr precious little to impede Russia from imposing its will in the region. Russia's western flank and its broad swaths of flat geography isn't so easily secured. The Russian enclave of Kaliningrad and the Russian-backed breakaway region of Trans... Nistria aren't Russian by accident. They bookend the narrowest part of the European peninsula. Securing them is vital for Russian national security interests, and in Moscow's view, the land bridge between them, better known as the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithu 
and Lithuania, Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine exist to either link and secure Russian interests or to threaten them. Securing Ukraine is no way, in no way the final step, but rather the necessary launching pad, along with Belarus, to securing the Baltic states and eastern Poland. I might have apologized for seeming alarmist before today's events, but I think the last several weeks have shown the lack of empathetic understanding of the West, uh, on the West's behalf of Russia and how it perceives its neighborhood and its future. The Russians do not see the Ukraine war as war of aggression or Putin's egotistical quest for Soviet glor glory. Expect, expect the Russians to fight as if their lives depend on the victory. In their minds, that's preci precisely what's on the line. <clears throat> and this kind of blows my mind because no one's invading you, Russia. NATO's, not a, NATO's a completely defensive, uh, defensive treaty. No one's getting. No, no one's trying to. No one's trying to inv inv invade you guys. You guys will, are f destroying yourselves as it, as it is. No one needs to go in and do anything <clears throat> to speed that up. Okay. Now, hopefully, that painted painted a solid picture here. Uh, I'm gonna get into um just some just some tweets uh, that that I've seen throughout the. Uh, <clears throat> and if you're watching on YouTube, hopefully I can get my editing shit together so you can just see my screen here. Um, uh, but we're just going to kind of go through rapid fire. Um, so, uh, also, Epic, on February 22nd, uh, the U.S. Embassy uh, in uh, Kiev uh, shows a photo of uh, Kiev in, in uh, 996, 1011, 1070, uh 1108 um and it shows all it shows you know buildings um it shows various churches cathedrals monasteries um and then it shows moscow moscow is just a forest making the point that yo bro we were here first okay uh okay so let's go rapid fire here because i think there were there was a lot of good uh a lot of good shit uh i read today um so here we go this is by Chris Murphy. Putin's decision to invade is an evil panic move of weakness and will be his defining mistake. The Ukrainian people will fight for as long as it takes to secure their nation from this foreign tyrant, and the United States will, will stand with them in this fight. Who is this bro? Oh, yeah, he's a senator uh, in Connecticut. Tonight, the entire post-World War international order sits on a knife uh, on a knife's edge. If Putin does not pay a devastating price for this transgression, then our own security will soon be at risk. We must be unceasingly in our assistance to the Ukrainian people. We must levy crippling sanctions on Russia, and we must cut off Putin and his cronies from the global economy. A strong, swift response is vital. And we must remember that Putin has plans for us, too. He and his agents will use this crisis to try to divide Americans from each other and to separate America from our allies. In this, we must remain vigilant and united. This is not a moment for politics to trump security. My thoughts tonight are with the brave Ukrainians who are fighting for their lives right now. As a frequent visitor, I've seen firsthand the love of country that defines Ukraine today. And I will do all I can to make sure America stands by them in this fight. This is by Adam Ozemek. Long, long past time for Manhattan Project for cheap, cheap green energy that bankrupts petrol states like Russia. Ruthlessly push costs down and sell the technology cheap around the world. Sanctions? How about economic and technological war on their primary export and industry? It's important to understand that while this war is going on, that's what it is, it's a war, it's a full-scale war, Europe is relying on Russia for oil and gas. They are the, Russia is the main energy supplier of Europe. All the sanctions that were announced, you know, the G7, Biden announced, I watched his address. Um, it's actually a, several countries, it's not just the G7 sanctions, it, bunch of, I think up to 28 countries or something like that, um, have sanctions and they have a carve out for energy purchases. And that's the, that's the, that's the main thing that keeps, keeps Russia's state, you know, keeps making them money, which is obviously if, if you just cut off the power, uh, uh, cut that line, Europe will go dark. It would lose heat straight up. So it's very easy to say, yo, why are they even buying it? So I, it's just a crazy thing to think about that that is the reason. That's even the reason that I, I think Europe even did any of this bullshit in the first place. They rely, you follow the money. They rely, they rely on their exports. Now, that's why Nord Stream 2, the pipeline that Germany, I, I think about it, I was like, why is Germany even entertaining that? Russia is literally a, it's a 
to thug-led state? What are you doing making a deal with them? While Germany at the same time is closing their fucking nuclear plants. It's absolutely ridiculous. So a Manhattan Project, the United States, it will be the United States. It can't not be the United States. Needs to create a solution, whether it's next generation nuclear energy that's fast, cheap, reliable, or fusion. A lot of interesting stuff going on in fusion right now. There needs to be a solution to this. Solar and wind is not fucking enough, okay? It's not even close to enough. Battery storage isn't even close to there. And yeah, and it's also more than that. How you what's gonna fuel planes? That needs to be replaced as well. So this this is this is how we 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 this is how we defeat Russia. This is it. As long as money keeps going to them, they ain't going to do shit. They're going to keep doing their thing. Uh, and it just blows my mind that this isn't a number one. This is a, def- this is a complete defense. This is a strategy. We, all the nations of these petrol states that rely on it for their well-being, stop fucking buying their oil. Well, it's easier said than done, so you got to cre- create a better, cheaper, faster faster alternative okay let's continue um okay after years of warnings were ignored in hearing this is by gary kasparov um who is a chairman of the human rights foundation um he says (coughs) okay after years of warnings were ignored in in hearing gary you were right all damn today uh, all damn day today. I'll repeat what I said in 2014. Stop telling me I was right and listen to what I'm saying now. My recommendations follow. Support Ukraine military, militarily, immediately, everything but boots on the ground. All weapons, intel, cyber. Bankrupt Putin's war machine. Freeze and seize Russia's finances and those of him is, and his gang. Kick Russia out of every international and financial institution. Pace, Interpol, etc. Recall all ambassadors from Russia. There's no point in talking. The new unified message is stop or be isolated completely. Ban all elements of Putin's global propaganda machine. Turn them off. Shut them down and send them home. Stop helping the dictator spread lies and hate. RT, state-run news media organization, has videos on YouTube, tweets. Fucking nuke them off. Nuke them off. Off of American platforms. Off of American... Off of any democratic nation that wants to... That believes in freedom should boot them off their servers. No one, no one should offer them help in this regard to spread their own propaganda. This goes for China as well. Expose and act against Putin's lackeys in the free world. If Schroeder and his ilk continue to work for Putin, bring charges. Ask the owners and advertisers of networks platforming Putin propagandists like Carlson why they allow it. Replace Russian oil and gas. Pressure OPEC. Increase production. Reopen Keystone. You can't save the planet if you don't save the people on it. Acknowledge there will be cost sacrifices. We waited too long. The price is high, but it will only get higher. It's time to fight cannot ignore the political fifth column of Putinists from far right and left in EU to the tankies and Trump and his GOP followers in the US they may have the right to support a brutal dictator's, dictator's war in order to criticize Biden but it's disgusting and anti-American do not forget there are no solutions only trade-offs we need to absolutely increase the fuck out of oil production fracking unload and we need to the, the way to get this is another Zion the way to get energy to Europe is liquefied natural gas. It's a, it's a difficult, we still got to build up a lot of infrastructure to do that, but that is the way we would do that. We would help bring them power, bring them their energy needs. Now it's a hell of a problem. What is it? 10 billion fucking something barrels a day or something, an insane amount flows out of Russia every day. It's a difficult problem, but we need, climate change is absolutely important. We talk a lot lot about on the show. We need to I have a Manhattan project. Listen, for thirty billion dollars, we created a fucking atomic bomb. We throw two trillion at COVID, and I got a free fucking test. Okay, what are we talking about here? We we need a Manhattan project to create a clean energy solution. It's going to be nuclear fusion. Sorry, solar. Sorry, wind. You're not going to fucking cut it. Well, at the same time, increasing oil production. Plain and simple. We need to do both because there won't be a planet where we're going. Let's continue. Mike Solana, love his tweets. He just says, thank God for fracking TBH. Now, in 2019, U.S. became the biggest producer of oil. Um, and, you know, people are, oh, man, I'm crying about that. Yeah, I'd much rather America's producing it than a Russia or a country in the Middle East, full stop. 
Nick Castro, he's a Bitcoin guy. Excuse me, Nick Castro. Nick Carter. So so Germany got Greta pilled and now can't enforce sanctions against you know, Greta Thunberg. Um, can't enforce sanctions against Russia or defund Europe because they'd freeze and starve. Turns out energy is a matter of national security. Who knew? Because German, German economy minister Habeck says 50% of our coal comes from Russia. 55% of our gas and 35% of our oil comes from Russia. Yeah, Greta Thunberg telling all of Russia, oh, close the nuclear power. You need to, uh, you know, green, green, green. Yes, no. No, the, every dollar that goes to Russia is literally is a disaster. Okay, it's mu it's a, an immediate immediate disaster. Climate change is absolutely here. It's coming, but it's not nearly as immediate as the as the anti freedom, anti democratic, anti international world order, anti peace thug nation that is Russia. Again, and China for that matter. If I was if I was from Ukraine, I'd never forget the anti-human environmentalists that shut down all the nuclear plants in Germany. They have a lot to answer for. I was working on another podcast titled Environmentalists Are Destroying the Planet. Their, their illogical calls for insane, insane restrictions on even building any clean energy projects because you want to save an owl is absolutely fucking ridiculous. I love nature more than, more than most. I love this. I love. I fucking love this planet more than most. Okay, I think it's beautiful. I love humanity more than most. I'll go that far. Okay, I want every human to be as rich as possible. I want every human to be able to consume as much energy and do as much and have as much freedom as they possibly can. So the answer is not to turn off the lights before you go home. The answer is to invest in technology that will better the human species. Okay. Now, worrying about some turtle shells while biodiversity is beautiful and we need to do what we can we have an immediate there won't be a fucking turtle to have a shell if the planet has burned alive okay so everything's a trade-off that's basically the whole podcast i was going to do okay the number one thing the u.s can do to salvage this nightmare situation eliminate all constraints on fracking eliminate all opposition to pipelines start exporting dirt cheap abundant liquid natural natural gas to europe that's what we were talking about earlier absolutely 100 percent fuck the politics this is what we need to do Okay, Paul Graham tweeted, this is Germany's first big moral test. Another dictator is doing what Hitler did. Inconveniently for Germany, they get half their natural gas from him, which will prevail. The principle that they, that they of all countries should understand or convenience. Sack up. There's going to be sacrifices. And sack up Americans too. There's going to be sacrifices here. Price of oil is going to increase until we keep producing a fuck ton. We need to subsidize the shit out of it right now. That is full stop. And if these sound, things I, I sound, uh, that I'm saying sound extreme, imagine the position that Ukraine is in right now, a free democratic society being invaded by a foreign autocrat. That is the absolute worst thing happening in, this, in the world right now, full stop. And we need to do everything to make Russia bleed and pay. Chris Miller tweeting, Putin's hometown protesting his war against Ukraine. I know I get a little hardo when I say I hate China, I hate Russia. I'm talking about their governments. Okay, let's be clear about that. Uh, there's plenty of protesters in Russia. I've seen plenty of videos and pictures. Russians are protesting. They're extremely brave to be doing that. It is absolutely illegal. There's not freedom of speech. There's not freedom to assemble. In Russia, you cannot do this. They will be tracked. Their faces will be scanned. They will absolutely be paying prices for what they're doing. It gives me shivers. I'm watching the video right now. It's fucking unbelievable. Okay. This is the vice president, uh, Xing Te Lei, of, uh, of Taiwan. The people and government of Taiwan stand with Ukraine. The principle of self-determination cannot be erased by brute force. Okay, Biden gave some remarks. Um, Mitt Romney, who, let's all remember, uh, in, what was that, Fook in 2013, um, when he was running for re-election against Mitt, the debates, uh, Mitt said Russia is an absolute threat. Obama said the Cold War called. They want their foreign policy back. Everyone laughed. Oh my God, Obama owned him. Well, Mitt was right. Mitt was right. Russia by far is the big biggest. Well, China, I actually think if I had to say one, I would say China. Absolutely. They're bigger, more powerful, and worse in many ways. Um, Mitt called this. And he's actually, as I look around, he's the only, he's the only thing, I, uh, only president that I, I would want in the White I, I don't see anyone else that could be in the White House um, after Biden. I literally don't see anyone else. Uh, riffing with some people on it. Uh, 
well, one of my old uh, BC track homies who knows a lot about this shit. He lives and breathes it every day. He works in this world. He said he doesn't have enough support. I'm like, Mitt is like the only, he's, a, he's the only guy I can fucking think of uh, that, can, that, that can lead our country uh, in 2024. Hopefully he runs. Uh, apparently he's not going to win. This guy knows what he's talking about. So, who knows? But he, he released a statement. Putin's Ukraine invasion is, is the first time in 80 years that a great power has moved to conquer a sovereign nation. It is without justification, without provocation, and without honor. Putin's impunity, predictability follows our tepid response to his previous horrors in Georgia and Crimea, our naive, our naive efforts at, at a one-sided reset, and the short-sightedness of America first, the 80s called, and we didn't answer. The peril of of again looking away from Putin's tyranny falls not just on the people of the nations he has violated, it falls on America as well. History shows that a tyrant's appetite for conquest is never satiated. America and our allies must answer the call to protect freedom by subjecting Putin and Russia to the harshest economic penalties, by expelling them from global institutions, and by committing ourselves to the expansion and moder modernization of our national defense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, uh, also... <clears throat> reading Biden's address. I had a couple comments on that. I tweeted, sanctions do not include energy payments. It was hilarious. He's like, oh yeah, and by the way, there's an energy payment carve out. I was like, blunt smoke? So Russia, natural gas and oil will still flow. Okay. Also, uh, they still have access to SWIFT and we'll talk about SWIFT. Um, it's the international banking system. That was money to flow. Um, he says Europe's not ready to do that. Specifically, I saw another tweet. That could be wrong. Again, there's a lot of information, but Biden said uh, uh, Europe's not ready to remove them from SWIFT, and specifically I read something else, Italy and one other country, I forget what it was, are the reasons that they're holding that up. Okay, and he kept getting questions, so a lot of reporters kept asking him about SWIFT access. Okay, let's go on. Something that I hope gets called out this week is the Western consultant legal class who, who've supported Russian oligarchs with glee. Ask any journalist who's written about such oligarchs. First email you get is 10 legal threats from a top white shoe firm in London or D.C. Literally, <sighs> must be an amazing life growing up as a kid dreaming of getting your legal degree from Yale, Stanford, Columbia working hard so you can threaten journalists, critics, and others with legal demands on behalf of billionaires this is by Chris uh, Bing who's a uh, Reuters reporter absolutely it's, a f it's fucking disgusting that is disgusting it's also disgusting to me that I was searching that that international stock market exposure. You can buy a fund to get exposure to the entire international market. There needs to be one that excludes China and Russia. They're most clearly the two most evil countries on the face of the earth that wish to destroy the international world order and have the means to fuck with it. I have an international portfolio. Anyone that has a 401k likely does. And it sickens me that I have ownership in Chinese and Russian companies. Uh, there is an iShares ETF that is emerging markets, ex excluding China. Um, there isn't one for Russia I could find, but this should be commonplace. It's blowing my mind. Fidelity, Vanguard, Blackstone, get off your fat asses and do something here. That's insane to me. My 401k, Americans' 401ks, should not be funding international destruction, which is what China and Russia are doing. Make no mistake. <coughs> okay, so it's... Uh, EU officials tell me at this point Germany and Italy are the main opponents for disconnecting Russia from SWIFT and the key to and this key to decision depends on them and they are pressured to agree. Yep, the West <coughs> The West will continue to buy energy okay, so Biden estimates the economic sanctions could cut off more than half of Russia's high tech imports, striking a blow to Russia. The sanction package was specifically designed to allow energy payments to continue. Hilarious. Um also, <coughs> the official Ukraine account at Ukraine has a cartoon of Hitler looking down at little Putin, holding him on the cheek and smiling at him. Yep, Putin, congrats, dude. You're trying to destroy Nazism, you claim. Nazis, total bullshit. Okay, let's talk about the SWIFT network. That's that payment network I was talking about. Sahil Bloom had a beast tweet on it. Let's go through it. With the rapid deterioration in the Russia-Ukraine situation, you're going to hear a lot about SWIFT in the coming days. Here's a quick breakdown of what it is and why it matters. SWIFT is short for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. It's a global cooperative of financial institutions based in Belgium. It was formed in 1973 when 239 banks from 15 countries came together to establish a way to handle cross-border payments. Today, SWIFT connects more than 11,000 financial institutions across 200 countries. 
the 200 plus countries. Think of it like a simple email system enabling secure messaging across its members. An average of 40 million messages a day, including orders, payment confirmations, uh, foreign exchanges, and trades. Swift doesn't actually do any transfer or holding of funds, but it's, an, but it's a critical part of the communication infrastructure that enables cross-border money flows. It's a key part of the global financial system's plumbing, if you will. So why is it in the spotlight right now? While not a political organization, its importance to global flows means SWIFT is often looked at as a geopolitical tool as part of sanctions packages. Cutting off a nation's banks from SWIFT access restricts flows into and out of that nation, resulting in real economic pain. This happened in 2012 with the sanctions package on Iran in retaliation for its nuclear program. It was looked at in 2013 14 in response to Russia's actions in Crimea. Cutting off swift access is viewed as a very significant move, so the consideration alone is material. With Russia's most recent actions in Ukraine, cutting off swift access is very much on the table as part of a sweeping sanctions package. The challenge is that it is a real double-edged sword. Russia is a massive economy with tentacles that reach all around the world. Now, that's true of Russia. Now, just imagine China. China's, what, 20% of world GDP? It's even far more tentacles than Russia. It's a much more difficult problem that we need to address and we need to face. And if things cost a little bit more, we'll fuck it. We need to figure it out. It's a key energy supplier to Europe and the world. It's an export of materials critical to the manufacturing of jet engines, semiconductors, automotives, electronics, and fertilizers. Cutting off Russia from SWIFT would impact the flow of payments for these industries. Russia has been building an in-house system since 2014. The last time SWIFT cut off was threatened, which may mean they are able to temper some of the impact a cutoff would have on its economy, though it appears most experts still expect the impact would be significant. A cutoff from SWIFT may also have longer-term second-order effects on Bitcoin and non-fiat currencies. The base logic, Russia may seek to circumvent the impact of the restrictions via a combination of its in-house system and a push away from the USD reserve currency hegemony. Whatever happens in the coming days, there will be a lot of talk about SWIFT and its role in the response to Russia's sanctions. I hope this short thread makes you feel more knowledgeable on the subject. Follow me. Boom. Boom. Okay. Best I can tell what the public wants on Ukraine is for Biden personally to prevent a Russian invasion, but without risking the life of a single American or a cent increase in the price of gas. I just thought that was hilarious. Yeah. I cannot believe that Russia and Putin has started an open war in Europe and how Europe is unprepared for any military response and support. All of us in Europe can only watch from the sidelines, hope for the best for Ukraine and hope pray uh, that Russian troops stop there. So there's a couple carve outs. The French and the UK absolutely have military capabilities. Um, all the other nations ain't worth their salt. Germany's military is totally gutted. Trump was absolutely right, as you know. Uh, I think he's a total scumbag, et cetera, et cetera. But it's interesting uh, to see, you know, uh, he was totally right on this. Pressuring NATO allies to spend 2% of GDP on defense, which is what they all agreed to. Yo, he went about it the wrong way. He was a total douchebag about it. But spend the money. Spend the money. Just, uh, Europe has relied on U.S. security for far too long. Uh, another vid uh, video of people marching through central Moscow this evening, chanting no to war. Mark Andreessen, uh, one of the foremost uh, great, great thinkers in the VC space. He's an absolute legend. He says, build a thousand new state-of-the-art nuclear power plants in the U.S. and Europe right now. We won't, but we should. Absolutely. Also, Moxie Marlin Spike, we t talked about in the last episode. Uh, he talks about how Telegram is the most popular me messenger in urban Ukraine. After a decade of misleading marketing and press, most people there believe it's an encrypted app. The reality is the opposite. Telegram is by default a cloud database with a plain text copy of every message everyone has ever sent received. Absolutely. Never been a fan of Telegram. It's a lit, uh, it's an IQ test if you use it. It's no, I don't, I don't trust it for a second. Think about all the work. Uh, think about all the woke VCs that denigrated uh uh, funding defense tech over the years. To them, I say, fuck you. Yeah. Um, how, where do you think this piece has come from the last 70 years? 80 years? Like, it's defense tech. It's who, the United States has had the biggest stick, and we need to absolutely keep investing in our military. We need to do it. There's a lot of fucking bullshit. We need to spend it on the right places. Tanks being built we don't need. Things we... Because of, you know local congress people like want want their factory to stay open in their state it, yeah that's a total scam but we need to absolutely keep spending money and we need to be ahead of the curve 150 percent michael weiss had an epic tweet i love seeing this shit and again who knows javelin's getting a good workout a ukrainian military official told me just now in 2014 we defend ourselves with rpgs and it was difficult to destroy t-72 tanks now it's not a problem also confirmed use of british and law anti-tank systems in the field I fucking love it. 
um, yeah, and I think we're going to see Ukraine actually has a better when the dust settles. We'll see. I think they're going to have have put up a lot, a much bigger fight than people thought. Um, RT.com went down. State uh, media uh, uh, organization. It's absolute trash. Uh, yeah. Fuck RT. The breathtaking bravery of the Russians who know they'll be arrested for protesting this war and do it anyway. God bless you all. Um, and as a reminder, uh, Europe uh, is going to continue buying go- gas and oil from uh, from Europe. Excuse me, from Russia. Okay. This has been epic. We're 45 minutes in. Now, there's a few other things um, I'm going to share here. Um, these are just things that I like. These aren't things that I retweet. So the, the bar is a little lower for these things. But let's just go through this and see what we got. Um, yeah, a lot of this is uh, duplicated. In the same way that COVID acts is in the same way that COVID uh, acted as an accelerator for various trends, tech, remote work, etc. I bet this exce- accelerates the shift to renewable energy. Absolutely. Um, Tulsi Gabbard had a dog shit tweet in support of in support of Russia. Um, worth uh, Ray, I hope I never get used to seeing American side with an enemy autocrat as he invades a free and sovereign country and attacks the very foundations of the post World War II order. We can't afford to let Axis propagandists pick us apart like this. Tulsi Gabbard, you're a scumbag and anti-American. Global politics doesn't get much clearer than this. An autocratic regime seeking to topple a democratic republic. If you're not in complete solidarity with the Ukrainian people, including their efforts to rebuff this invasion with NATO's aid, you too are on the wrong side of history. Every dollar in trade with Russia since he invaded Ukraine in 2014, every euro of corrupt deals with his cronies helped Putin build the war machine he is using to slaughter civilians in Europe today. Now you must help Ukraine fight against the monster you helped create. Jordan Weissman, turns out we probably needed a bigger strategic oil reserve. Long term, fossil fuels are a geopolitical liability as well as a climate menace. In the short term, need the frackers to get fracking. Absolutely, 100%. It's time to eject Russia from the Council of Europe. A decision to this effect by two thirds of the members would be sufficient. Moscow should have no seat at the table at any relevant international forum while it continues its aggression against democratic Ukraine. Absolutely. If the civilized world was as serious about sanctions, it would sever all ties with autocratic regimes that attempt to redraw national boundaries via force. Zero trade, zero internet connectivity, zero money flows, zero visas. Absolutely, 100%. Where does this lead? It leads to the destruction of... Any of this stuff sounds extreme. Follow where this leads if we don't act. Just back from the background... Just back from background briefing with a senior U.S. defense official. Important details that the Pentagon is seeing about the assault on Ukraine. More than 100 missiles launched at Ukrainian targets last night. They came from Belarus, Russia, and the sea. Airports and other military targets were the primary emphasis last night, but it appears Russia is moving to take control of Kiev and other cities next, officials say. We would describe what you are seeing as an initial phase of a large-scale invasion, senior U.S. defense defense officials say. Caution that the U.S. will not have perfect visibility of what is happening. No U.S. aircraft overhead. Three main axes of assault so far, officials say. It says, from Belarus south, from Crimea north, and from the Belgrad area of Russia to around Kharkiv, uh, officials say ground incursion from Belarus to north of Kiev and helicopter troops uh, inserts into Kharkiv area. They're making a move on Kiev, senior U.S. official says. What they're doing with Kiev is hard to say. U.S. estimates that about 75 Russian fixed-wing aircraft, including bombers, were involved last night. Among the targets were nearly 10 airfields. Okay, there's a lot more details on that. We don't want to get too wrapped up in that, but it's a great... Uh, it's a great thread. What preparations against aggression are the U.S. and democracies making to prevent China from following the same playbook in Taiwan than the, Russia, than the one Russia just used in Ukraine? Urgent preparation against aggression is the only way to prevent this crisis from metastasizing. Absolutely. Maybe Germany can stop letting its energy policy be dictated by a Swedish teenager now. Oh, talking about Greta Thunberg. Absolutely hilarious. Germany, wake the fuck up. So something interesting that could be developing at the UN. Ukraine appears to be laying the groundwork to challenge whether the Russian Federation is the legitimate successor of the USSR's seat and veto on the Security Council. Beautiful. Um, With the rapid deterioration of... Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, Okay, so excuse me, 10 billion, I said. I'm I'm an idiot. Russia exports 5 million barrels of oil daily. Um, If Russia geography can... Okay, so... um, Uh, Scott, the Second Amendment, Amendment is not about hunting. Ukraine to declare state of emergency, grant citizens right to bear arms. Absolutely. 
China's watching and waiting to invade Taiwan. Absolutely. On Thursday, China's customs agency approved imports of wheat from all regions of Russia, giving Putin an alternative to Western markets that might be closed under possible sanctions. China. But it's so clear. It's so beautiful. China, Russia, you two are the enemies. China, absolutely. Um, okay, so a lot of the stuff I've already discussed. Ooh, this was another extraordinary televised Kremlin meeting, this one with oligarchs. The head of the industrialist lobby group tells Putin to avoid wrecking the Russian economy further and responding to Western sanctions. Putin responds, describing today's invasion as a necessary measure. Kremlin spokesman says, goal of special operation Ukraine, it is necessary to liberate Ukraine, to clear it of the Nazis, but Ukraine is not run by Nazis, and Ukrainians say they don't want Russia to liberate them. Yeah. Um, okay, and this is confirmed. European utilities are set to buy tomorrow more Russian natural gas from Gazprom via Ukraine pipelines. Yes, you read that right. Europe will be buying more natural gas from Russia via Ukraine tomorrow. Yes, let that sink in. <clears throat> ben Hunt kind of kind of screams from the rooftops a little bit, but kicking Russia off swift is the only sanction that matters. It's why Putin reacted so forcefully to the threat. Everything else is just bullshit theatrics. The invasion of Ukraine is over. Putin won. China won. We lost. But hey, stonks are now green. We're all we're all winners, am I right? I wouldn't say the invasion of Ukraine is over. Um, as expected, no sanctions on Russian oil from Europe or the United States. I cannot believe that Russia and Putin has started an open war in Europe and how Europe is... Oh, yeah, we've, we've riffed on that. Okay, here's something interesting. How important are, are other countries to Russia in terms of trade? Here are a few facts using trade data as recent as November 2021. The West is not that important in terms of exports. U.S., U.K., France is less than China, Turkey, uh, Kazakhstan. Um, yeah, so when it comes to imports, China is even more important, a quarter of it all. Uh, there's a lot of Germany, Italy, France, South Korea, Japan, the United States. There's some imports from them, but we, uh, it all needs to stop. So that's why uh, this may not, the, the sanctions might not be enough. They knew these sanctions were coming. They have enough um, autocratic regimes and scumbag countries to trade with it. They're going to be okay. Um, just a funny tweet. Maybe we can build some pipelines now. Absolutely. What is the US's, USA's China policy? Why has... Hasn't POTUS appointed a U.S. grand strategy coordinator to his cabinet to achieve an integrated policy versus the axis of autocrats across all U.S. government agencies? When should we expect the full national security strategy document? Absolutely. Um, also, ESG investing uh, by Mark Andreessen equals surrender, uh, leads to surrender, domestic nuclear, oil, and natural gas, reliance on unreliable transient solar and wind, dependence on foreign energy powers. Absolutely. Um, okay. The mayor of Kiev, Vitalik Kishko, a former heavyweight boxing champion, says he plans to take up arms to defend the country. Fun fact, uh, Vitalik, uh, or, uh, Vitali is one of the two heavyweights uh, of two heavyweights all time to never have been knocked down in a fight. I hope he has one more in him. Um, yeah. Uh, I think we're... Okay. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> One more. Info on Russian uh, airborne operation against Antonov Air Base in Gostomol. So, any of this stuff, this is from a, a source that, it, you know, who, who know? you got to be careful with this stuff, but I'm still going to read it. But the, anything specific about what is exactly happening in terms of military, I don't trust random, uh, you know, tweets. It, this stuff is very difficult as the information flows out. A lot of it's wrong. Um, I think the only thing you can really trust is uh, the U.S. And, and our allies uh, in, in terms of what they say and how depending on what they release, um, how things actually went down. But this is a beautiful little story to end on. Well, it seems the Russian Helleborn assault on Antonov Gostomol Hostomol Airport, 15 kilom kilometers northwest of Kiev, ended in a complete catastrophe. Not only that, the VKS paid a heavy price just to bring the airborne troops to their target. It lost six to seven helicopters, including two confirmed ka 52 several of these two Ukrainian MiG-29s, but then the expected para-jump didn't take place. Obviously, the Ukrainian air defenses are still up, and the Russians couldn't fly in the expected eight, 18 to 20 <clears throat> 76s. The Russian VDV held out as long as supported by their air force this afternoon, but later, later on, the 4th Rapid Response Brigade of the Ukrainian National Guard counter counterattacked with support from the Ukrainian Air Force. The attached photo is shown... Uh, a Ukrainian Su-24M bombing the Russians there. What was left of the VDV was then was then finished by the 
45th Ukrainian Spetsnaz Brigade. Few survivors scatter and, and run away into the nearby forest. So there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of stuff coming uh, like that over the next few days. I think we're going to be surprised at how well the Ukrainians fight. This isn't even close to over. This is an occupation of a country with millions of people that's twice the size of Texas. Okay, let that sink in. And this isn't the deserts of of you know the Middle East. This is it's much easier. It, excuse me. It's much more difficult for Russia to invade a country like Ukraine because people can be far more spread out and the insurgency is real and they will be supplied they will be supplied by the United States and her allies uh, this is just beginning I don't see how this in, the insurgency can't be indefinite until Ukraine and its country is fully free you can't subjugate millions what is there 50 million people in Ukraine something like that no. Also an interesting thing. Uh, this would have been different if uh, Russia invaded uh, 10 years ago or something. Uh, but Ukraine is far more, uh, due to Russia's antics, their annexation of Crimea and all their bullshit they've been doing, the Ukrainians are much more hardened. They're much less sympathetic to Russia. Much less sympathetic. They're not going to be met with, with people cheering them on. They're going to be met with harsh resistance Ukrainians will fight uh, yeah it's it's absolutely this history history is back online uh, we need to look at this as what it is in absolute this is more than a warning shot it, shot, it has begun the autocratic regime of Russia and China, those two regimes, they're in bed with each other, call it what it is. It's time to face that reality. It's time to build an international, democratic, free people coalition and cut Russia and China out from the international system. Much easier with Russia, while still difficult. Much more difficult with China. But nothing less is at stake here than the than world peace than international order the order that has existed since post world war 2 ukrainian people the united states the world civilized nations democratic nations everywhere stand behind you fight for freedom go for it we're all with you. We're all watching. And hopefully the lives lost, hopefully the, the, the horrors, war is absolutely miserable, horrible. I mean, think of it. We bitch when like our car breaks down. Oh my God. Imagine your whole fucking everything breaking down. Oh, you couldn't get to work. Your work doesn't exist anymore. Your complete beautiful routine that you've built out is gone Hopefully this isn't done in vain. Hopefully it's not done, excuse me, hopefully it's not done without the world learning from it and taking lessons that end up saving far more lives than were lost. This was a wake-up call, Ukraine, who increasingly, who wanted to join NATO, uh, who has increasingly been aligning itself with Western interests, who has increasingly been removing Soviet statues and de they've called it the decommunization of their nation that they started taking part in uh, in 2014 we stand with you this is a lesson for the world to wake the fuck up we need to let the oil flow the united states needs to unload we need to help our allies we need to supply them with the energy we need to cut russia off we need to cut china off Nothing less than world peace is at stake here. Thank you for listening. It's No Gradient Podcast. I'm Dick Lucas. Ukraine. Best of luck. We're watching. The world is watching. We will learn from this. Let's 
rise up. Let's use this as an opportunity. This is a fucking wake-up call. The Ukrainian brothers and sisters that will be dying, that will be fighting. Let that not go to waste. Let's act. It's time. Russia and China are evil. Straight up. We need to face that. We need to look in the mirror. We need to face that. We need to do a lie with each other. And we need to address it. Thank you. We're with you, Ukraine. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.